If they'd hoped in Greater Manchester or Sheffield that restrictions might be eased, those hopes were dashed today. The first formal review of the tier system saw even more of England placed into the highest tier three. The Health Secretary's preamble, a clear sign of what was to come. Controlling infection rates is about limiting patient harm. And this is a moment when we act with caution. In the southeast of England, cases are up 46% in the last week. Hospital admissions are up by more than a third. In the east of England, cases are up two thirds in the last week, and hospital admissions are up by nearly half. The assessment for why each area falls into which tier has been published. So in Berkshire, for instance, they go into tier three because rates have risen by 10% or more over the past seven days, including here in Reading. Two weeks ago, uh, he did say that we have the virus under control. And he also said, we can't risk letting cases rise again, especially into Christmas. But I'm afraid that is exactly what is now happening, isn't it? Certainly pressure on hospitals is once again growing. In the past week alone, there were 44 ambulance diverts, which means A&E units not taking patients temporarily. Unusual this early in the season. This virus does not take a break for Christmas. Um, and I really don't want to go back to a sit the situation that we had in March and April, where we turned our world upside down. We admitted so many people, and my soul is still not quite recovered from the things that we had to deal with then, and quite how ill and quite how unwell so many people were. Most of the country is already in the two toughest tiers of restrictions, with only Cornwall, the Isle of Wight and the Isles of Scilly in Tier 1. On Saturday, though, Herefordshire will join them. While hospitality venues in Bristol and North Somerset will be able to reopen as they move down to Tier 2. It's a different picture further east, as areas including Bedfordshire, Buckinghamshire and Hastings move up into Tier 3. That will be 68% of England's population, 38 million people living under the toughest restrictions. There are baubles in Bristol, but delight at moving down into tier two was decidedly muted. I was stood here and I was like, yes, tier two. But then I was like, actually, I hope people don't now, you know, go overboard and ruin it. And then we have another lockdown in January. Clearly for businesses point of view, I'm sure they'll be very, very happy that they're going to be able to open up and welcome all these people in who will then spread the germs around. <laughs> you just wonder if it's going to cause another lockdown in January, really. Across the border in Wales, their figures suddenly looked so much worse after a computer upgrade meant more than 11,000 results weren't loaded into the system until this afternoon. Tougher Christmas measures had already been announced as hospitals reported being overwhelmed. It is a bleak run up to Christmas and the health secretary's statement to the house today was sprinkled with calls for people to take personal responsibility for their own and their loved ones safety while raising once again the hope that the vaccines will eventually provide a way out of this disaster. Well, earlier I spoke to Professor Helen Stokes Lampard, Chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners, and I started by asking her which parts of the NHS were under the most strain. Oh, it's all parts of the NHS. So, you know, yes, of course, we talk about proportion of intensive care beds being used, and that is very serious in London right now. But actually, A&E departments, we've got ambulances queuing, waiting to offload patients in many departments, that, and departments that are just not designed to keep people apart. So, you know, actually keeping those with COVID apart from those who don't is really hard. And so putting everybody at increased risk. You talked about pressure in London on the intensive care units, how close to capacity are that if you can be specific about different trusts or different parts of the capital? We've been hearing in the last day that Bart is at 95% capacity. We've been hearing there are less than 50 intensive care beds left for the whole of London. And I mean, London has a huge number of hospitals and is actually very well served with hospitals per capita compared to the rest of the, the, the country. So actually, that is a great cause for concern. We've had two national lockdowns in England. Uh, we've got the tier system. Is any of it working, given you're saying in some parts of the country it is actually worse than the first wave now? We can certainly see benefit of lockdowns. The, the harder the restrictions you put in, the more this disease slows 
lockdown. We've seen it in the northeast and the northwest of England, probably most graphically. People made big sacrifices uh, a few weeks ago. Those have reaped benefits. Um, Actually, in the rest of the country, we're seeing it get things going the other direction still. I'm based in the Midlands and we're seeing an upswing in numbers after things starting to improve. In London, things are significantly worse having started to improve. This virus can be predicted and it is doing what it does best, which is reproduce and keep causing mischief. So what needs to change? Is it people's behaviour, taking personal responsibility for their action, or does the government need to be tougher, for example, over these Christmas restrictions, where they've kind of said, well, you know, you can do all this stuff over Christmas, but we advise you not to? The decision about what happens over Christmas is hugely divisive. And the rules are really simple. The science bit of this is the easy bit, yeah? The science is the more you mix, the more you're in close proximity to people, the more the disease will spread and numbers will go up. So the science and the rational bit of it would say, keep everyone apart, keep everyone locked down. The problem is that it's far more than science. And, and as doctors, we think both in terms of the art and the science when we're thinking about people. We know that there's been a massive psychological um, impact on people of being apart from loved ones. So we try and balance these things out. We recognise that sort of the government is, is doing the, the ultimate balancing act. And I think we perhaps need to stop thinking about shouting at people for decisions they are or are not making and think about what each of us can do. So yes, personal responsibility is part of this. Just because the guidance say you can do something, it doesn't mean you should. They're the absolute maximum. We shouldn't be looking for ways to circumvent the guidance or push it to the limit. We should be saying, actually, how can I moderate my behaviour? How can I do the least amount of interacting with others to reduce the chances and to reduce the risks of the people I love? That's what it comes down to. Do you prioritise your physical health or your mental health? Because the two are in tension as to whether you meet people over Christmas. They are in direct tension, which is why everyone has to make a personal decision based within the guidelines. I mean, please don't go any further than the guidelines. But what, what can you get away with? What will do the least harm? That's what it's all about. It's making the, the best decision of a whole heap of bad choices. That's the reality of it. And actually, for what it's worth, if you haven't picked up from the accent, I'm Welsh. My family in Wales, I live in the Midlands. I won't be visiting them this Christmas. That's hard, really hard. But it's the right thing. Yeah, I can see you're emotional about that. I mean, I you, you dearly hope to visit them. Yeah, but that's How... just the way it is. Take us through that decision-making, how you came to that conclusion, because I think all of us are wrestling with this right now. Of course we're wrestling, but do you know, actually, I had a, a straight conversation with them. And I just said, I'm really worried. And I, I fear that I could bring the disease to you. I mean, I'm in a tier three area. They're in South Wales, which is also in a very high risk area. And some members of my family have recently had COVID. Uh, and they've really worked well to not spread it further amongst themselves. And actually, to, to undo that work and the sacrifice that people have already made through isolating... I'm relieved that the most vulnerable in my family haven't had the disease. It's been the fitter ones that have had it. Wouldn't it be terrible if I took the disease to them? How would I, how would I look back at this winter? Professor Stokes Lampard there talking to me earlier. And there is an immediate crisis facing Welsh hospitals too as they struggle to deal with record numbers of patients being admitted with COVID. Earlier, I spoke to the Executive Medical Director of the Swansea Bay Health Board, Dr Richard Evans, and I started by asking him about the scale of the pressure hospitals in Swansea are under. So over the past few weeks, we've seen a sustained uh, increase in the rate of community transmission of COVID in the Swansea Bay area. Uh, we're a health board that covers a population of about 400,000 people. Uh, the figures that are given will, will tell us that uh, 700 people per 100,000 population are currently getting infected. That might seem meaningless to a lot of people. That translates currently into the rates of infection in Swansea of two people every five minutes catching COVID. Uh, so it's really a very, very high level. We're in a precarious situation and we're clearly hugely concerned about what might happen next. Well, when you talk about being in a precarious situation, what does that mean in real terms? What are you worried about that you might start happening now? We're already um, seeing alongside the patients who are presenting to hospital with COVID our typical winter pressures, so people who will present with those typical respiratory conditions that we see during the winter months. And added to that, of course, particularly where there's a higher rate of community transmission, our staff, who are also our citizens, are equally affected. And so staffing becomes an added challenge. 
they are fatigued um, during this wave. There's no doubt about that. And there's that added pressure when colleagues need to be off work and isolating. Um, they are managing, they're rising to the challenges as, as they always do. But clearly what we want to do is to, to um, is not to get to a situation where that becomes um, unmanageable or that we don't have sufficient staff to make care as safe as it possibly can be. What kind of patients are you seeing now? Is it mainly elderly still or are there other age ranges represented? So the vast majority of people that we're seeing that need to come to hospital are in their 50s upwards. Um, certainly the deaths, sadly, that we're seeing are in the older age group. Um, I think perhaps one of the messages that's been lost, though, is although we're concerned about our hospital capacity and what happens to people um, and, the, and um, the mortality associated with COVID, we're obviously, as a health board, equally concerned about patients who don't at the current time need to be in hospital, they're developing COVID in the community. And we know, for example, that people in their 20s and 30s and 40s, while it's unusual for them to come to hospital, there are significant numbers of those who are developing persistent symptoms after recovering from coronavirus. This is a disease we haven't dealt with before. And we're concerned that there may be long-term health effects to those individuals who have though that so-called long COVID. You talked at the beginning of this interview about the sheer scale of infection that you're witnessing. Um, it's not that long, just about five weeks or so, since the end of the lockdown in Wales. Now there's talk of another lockdown, December 28th. Are these lockdowns actually working? I think that we definitely saw a benefit from the lockdown in Wales uh, that we had in October. Uh, there's no doubt about that. We saw numbers drop, uh, but unfortunately that wasn't sustained. Infection essentially has seeded itself amongst the local community. And so it doesn't take very much for that resurgence to happen, as opposed to in the first wave where it was a new infection coming in entirely to our population, same across the whole of the UK. It's rising up from that seeding in the community now. Dr Richard Evans, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much.